um, let us begin. Uh, we're going to have a rather diverse session, and uh, we're going to start uh, with Jules Beekwilde from Isobionics in Geelen, the Netherlands, who will speak to us about biotechnology for producing essential oils and beyond, and explain why that is relevant to environmental concerns. I'll ask the speakers please to keep to 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to signal uh, three minutes before the, the end. end. Okay. okay. Thank you. Would you like to go ahead? Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank all the organizers of this conference, very interesting conference to invite us. Uh, or at me for uh, giving a presentation. I'm from a company, not from basic science. Been working in basic science for 30 years, so I know a little bit about the merits of basic science, but I now give you uh, a company presentation. Uh, first of all, so a little bit about the company. So we are Isobionics is our name. We produce terpenes for the flavor and fragrance industry. We were founded in 2008. We're located in Geleen in the Netherlands, so it's a bit in the south of the Netherlands, in the old mining district of the Netherlands. We have a team of about 25 people. This includes logistics and uh, production and things like that, but there's like 12 people in research and most of them have a PhD actually. Uh, since 2019, we've been absorbed by the big chemical industry. So what we do is also relevant for the chemical industry. Um, so, a little bit about essential oils and terpenes. So, what are those? So, it's quite a big industry, I would say. So, things that you might know is turpentine, for example, it's quite big volumes every year. It's a byproduct of the wood pulping industry for paper and for tar. Uh, and it's used as a starting material for fragrances. Quite big volumes are being used there. Uh, another example is citrus oil. Uh, you can see here on the right, you see uh, I think this is the pointer. Yes, you see here a list of uh, top 20 essential oils. Orange is number one, 51,000 ton. This was in 2009, has increased or stayed the same more or less. Uh, orange oil is very important because it is in like 60% of the soft drinks that you use. So in Coca-Cola, CC, whatever, or anything that tastes like an orange or remotely tastes like an orange has orange oil in it. Uh, so we are in, uh, we use it a lot. Um, there are pressure on this essential oil uh, industry because um, turpentine, for example, the paper, there's much less and less paper being produced because it's used less actually because we live in the digital area. Uh, so that means also there's less turpentine. Uh, orange oil, there's a big disease already for 20 years going on in, uh, in orange cultivation in Florida, in Brazil, in many big, really big and significant uh, areas. Uh, and this causes that, uh, yeah, just the harvest, people also give up on cultivating oranges because they get these like green, little bit hard fruits which have a, a poor taste and uh, also their oil is of inferior quality, actually. Uh, that means that the prices of orange oil go up, no? because the availability is lower and the, the quality goes down. Uh, so as a consequence, alternatives are being looked for eh? because you still need to um, produce these, uh, you know, you need, you need to have these soft drinks, or at least there's a market for these soft drinks and companies try to, to uh, still have their oil in it, so they go to petrochemistry. So they try to make it from oil because this is what they are used to do. No? So they are synthetic chemists, they can do this. Um, so I give you an example of how this works a little bit from, uh, so not so much from uh, orange, but from another product. So this is called alpha -bitabolol. You can see it in many skincare products, actually. So in shaving creams, in uh, skin creams, it's, it comes from German chamomile, uh, and it is really already for hundreds of years is known as, as being good for the skin. Uh, it has all kind of anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial uh, um, wound healing properties, so you, it helps in, in after shaving. Um, but chamomile is actually not sufficiently available um, to 
to make these skin care products. Chamomile is being cultivated mainly for tea, uh, which is a big market. But uh, yeah, if you would use all the chamomile for, uh, so if you want to produce chamomile for this, all these skincare products, you would need like 250,000 hectares. And so this doesn't mean much to you, I guess, but this is like a quarter of the arable land in the Netherlands. Uh, and that's quite a lot, no? because in the Netherlands we really produce a lot of agricultural products. Uh, so that means it would have a big footprint on uh, food production, basically. Yeah? So that's why uh, well, this is not happening, also because it's, it's really too expensive to do that. Also, uh, you need a good purification process for that uh, in order to have the visible oil coming out of that, because normally chamomile oil is blue. And having blue color in skincare products is, uh, is, is not, uh, it's not, it doesn't sell well. Um, so then people have looked for an alternative source for that. Huh? And there's a tree in Brazil, the Candaya tree, which is, is like packed with bisabolol. So you can, it's like 70% bisabolol in, in the oil. So what people do is they take the, the tree from the wild, basically, huh? so basically from uh, this area of Brazil, there's a lot of wild trees growing there. Uh, they take it, uh, they steam distill the whole tree, and um, so this costs like 10,000 or 20,000 trees per year. Uh, and uh, so then, well, it, they don't have any plantations of this tree, so that means this tree slowly grows as extinct. Uh, since 2011, the main buyer of this material is called Simrise, is a German company that does that and that involves that in skincare huh, formulations. Uh, they stop buying this natural visible oil, but what do they do? They go for a petrochemical solution. So they go to oil, take a fraction of the oil, do a chemical conversion, and then they have visible oil. Um, oil. So it's a solution, it's good for the natural, for the conservation of the nature, but on the other hand, it's another use of a non-sustainable source for producing these materials. Um, so there are so alternatives to produce essential oils, not from plants, but from different sources, is chemical synthesis. So they use this steam cracked petrochemical oil, and uh, this then goes into isobutylene, and then they have conversions and they make uh, for example, geraniol is an, an, a rose oil ingredient, so it's quite frequently used in perfumes and in uh, skincare products also. Alternatively, you can use fermentation, and this is what we do. Uh, so um, our process is such that we have a bacterium, there's a gene from a plant in that bacterium, uh, or a part of a, pa a, a biochemical pathway of a plant in that bacterium. We put that in fermentation, so in a la large vessel, it's like a 100 cubic meter vessel or so. We feed that with glucose, which is then coming from, yeah, it's coming from uh, uh, corn starch mostly. And then we do a fermentation process. We distill out the material that we produce. And then we have the same materials that are uh, ingredients of the essential oil, uh, in this case, orange oil. So in this way, uh, we make uh, a number of products now, so uh, we have uh, this, we are in the market since 2013, so we have a, a, a portfolio of products mainly for the citrus oil industry, and uh, so the main customers that we have are companies that already produce essential oil from citrus, so it's basically they are in the, in the citrus areas, and they use our materials to, uh, you know, to to make their, to improve the quality of their oils. So you have to imagine if you have Coca-Cola, for example, you cannot imagine that uh, a Coca-Cola from 2021 tastes different from a Coca-Cola from 2022. Uh, so with wine you can have that, but with Coca-Cola you cannot have that. So they, as their uh, citrus oil that they include in that needs to be the same every year. Every batch needs to be the same. So to make that the same, they use our products. Um, so how do we, how does this connect to basic science? Huh? Uh, so we, we need it, so what does our platform, if you like, look like? Huh? We have a bacterium, there's uh, glucose coming in, and then we have uh, two pathways, like a plant has two pathways to form these kind of compounds. So we also include two pathways, there was one originally already, we included another one. 
and then we include the terpene synthase, so this is the plant gene that we include, and then we make our product, this is then going out, and then part of the carbon also goes to growth of the bacterium. Uh, so, how did we establish this? Well, we stand on the shoulders of 30 years of basic science, basically. Yeah. So the main aim of that basic science was to understand how the plant makes essential oil. So we, there's a lot of ethnobotany has been done there to screen for plants that make interesting compounds. Phytochemistry is involved in that. Uh, all of them very old uh, and very basic science uh, um, skills. Then more modern is genomics. We do a lot, uh, so plants, uh, sequencing plants. This is uh, being done a lot for fundamental science also. Recently we've been uh, using a lot of machine learning actually to also to understand better the plant, uh, how it makes it. And of course there's a lot of microbiology involved in the, in the microorganism itself. So, um, so how do, so the concept is sustainable, huh? you have something that, that grows very efficiently, that produces uh, glucose like corn, you take the corn, uh, you produce an in essential oil ingredient from that and in that way you are uh, avoiding to use uh, um, oil, so uh, like petrochemical oil as a starting material. So this is a, a good, I, I find this myself a sustainable concept. Uh, but so how does it compare to the plant way of producing uh, uh, compounds and the chemical way of producing compounds? So I've made this table a little bit to give you an idea of where our challenges are. Uh, so the first challenge is energy efficiency. No? So I think producing things by plants is very efficient because you can just put them in the field normally uh, and they grow from sunlight and water. So that is uh, very, so very good for the plant and we are, uh, well, we, uh, we take more energy than the plant does. The chemical industry takes, of course, of course much more en energy to do that. For purification, however, of plant material, you have to realize that you, these essential oils, they are in the background, so there's usually like between 0 0.1 and 1% of essential oil in uh, plant biomass. So you need a lot of purification steps to get out your favorite compound or to get out your favorite oil. And uh, with uh, chemical synthesis and with fermentation, this is much easier and much less energy intensive. Uh, feedstock is a very important uh, aspect. No? So uh, plants, of course, have as feedstock CO2 and light and water. Uh, chemical industry has uh, uh, petrochemical oil as a feedstock. In fermentation, we have glucose, so we use the same, well, we use a renewable material there. The yield on feedstock, so the yield on sunlight, and so may be very poor, but on the other hand, it doesn't cost anything. So you could say, well, this is very high yield on feedstock. Chemical feedstock is used efficiently, but um, there are still challenges there. And also for us, I think we use a lot of glucose to produce not so much essential oil, and this still needs to be improved. And for this, we need basic science solutions. No? So basic science need to help us there. Uh, so another uh, important aspect for sustainability is competing claims for food and land. So we use glucose to produce our materials. And you can also eat glucose, actually, as a human. So we take there uh, a stream of the food to produce food ingredients, but still we lose efficiency there. So this is something that uh, yeah, we need to improve on. Uh, agriculture, so if you produce uh, essential oils, for example, patchouli or uh, and those kind of things, uh, mint, you take uh, surface away from food production. Uh, so um, we do that very efficiently. We don't need a lot of surface to, of food to produce our uh, food ingredients, but still uh, we could do better. Uh, low water use, so it was especially highlighted in the previous talks. I think uh, yeah, agriculture needs a lot of water. A chemical industry does not need a lot of water. We need water and we need to work on uh, how to recycle that water. Uh, pesticide use is of course something we don't do, but they do in agriculture quite a lot. 
Um, they also have chances for failed production, which is then yeah very bad for the economy, uh, I would say. Uh, for us, this is less of an issue. And biodiversity threats, so if people harvest wild species, as I just showed you, this is also not a very sustainable uh, way of doing it. If you want to read more, you should read this paper. Uh, very interesting paper. I have three minutes left, I understand. Uh, so, um, well, uh, I will skip this slide then, uh, but I will go to, uh, so what are the challenges now? So, to integrate complex plant pathways <coughs> into microbes, this is still a very uh, challenging thing. So, a microbe likes to grow, no? this is what it has evolved to do, and it's very difficult to make it, to, to use, to, uh, well, to bring it to use the carbon for something else than growth. So what we do is we try to make the, the pathway that we use for making the essential oil ingredients, we try to uh, help to make it, the microbe meet that pathway to multiply. And in that way we can uh, make it produce more. Uh, and so uh, other issues for, uh, for uh, so we, we want to go to products of lower price, so now we work on very expensive essential oils, but we want also to work on cheap essential oils like turpentine or even cheaper uh, building blocks or fuels or so for the chemical industry and make them by fermentation. But for this you need a lot of uh, knowledge how to improve your system huh? and how to uh, make it, uh, so all these things are often toxic. Uh, so you need to uh, enhance your microorganism, the carbon efficiency needs to be en enhanced. And if you can produce something without air, so anaerobically, that is also a big advantage because you don't need all the energy to stir, to bubble air through it and so on. And, so, and the production of more complex molecules for pharma applications is also a challenge. You can see here, well, the challenge there is also understanding the pathway, so there's for example, making this cancer drug, finblastin, it takes 30 enzymatic steps. This is usually done in the Madagascar periwinkle. This is a plant. It uses 30 steps. If, first of all, you need to discover all these genes. Then you need to introduce them in the microbe. You need to organize the microbe that it supplies all the substrates and cofactors. And then you need the microbe to, to produce it into the culture medium so that you can harvest it and not that it's <coughs> included somewhere in the biomass. So, um, my conclusions, fermentation technology is becoming a reality for flavor and fragrance industries, and so it's really becoming true. It's not uh, no longer only scientific papers, but uh, we earn money with doing that. Chemical companies invest in fermentation technology. I think this is a good sign. You know? They try to step away from uh, petrochemical sources. This is not only for the flavor and fragrance industry, but for all the industry. And, well, I showed you a little bit of the roadmap for sustainability challenges in fermentation technologies. And uh, basic science is really needed to help us in solving uh, the issues in that roadmap. With that, I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, our next speaker is Dr. Svobodan Vukicevic uh, from the uh, Croatian Academy. He's at the Laboratory for Mineralized Tissue as at the Center for Regenerative uh, Medicine at the University of um, um, sorry, of Zagreb. That's right. Okay, thank you. Please. Good morning, everybody. I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Nebuša Neskovic who gave me this kind uh, invitation. Today I'm speaking on behalf of the Croatian Academy of uh, Sciences and Arts. I became a member of the World Academy uh, many years ago <clears throat> and it is my great pleasure today to give you some overview of the science we are doing. Uh, I will show you what is my opinion, what is now going on uh, mainly in the European community regarding uh, funding of basic science and I think if you don't have an uh, extension of your original basic discoveries it is very difficult to get uh, funding. So uh, what is, um, you know, our major field is uh, 
uh, growth factors which are called bone morphogenetic proteins. We have published uh, many books of that and I have been involved in these discoveries uh, from the beginning. Uh, these are the only growth factors uh, which at the time uh, became uh, involved in clinical use. Uh, this is our last book uh, from uh, 2017, uh, mainly reviews by leading scientists uh, in the world. But what I want to spend today is to show you how the group of family members, which are all called TGF-beta uh, family members or BMP superfamily, it is a wrong name because TGF-beta was discovered by Anita Roberts and Michael Sporn and uh, the sequence of the genes was published uh, before the bone morphogenetic proteins. But what I want to show you today is uh, one of the bone morphogenetic proteins. This is uh, BMP6, uh, which we and others have discovered uh, many years ago. And the whole family of these proteins is today more than 30 to 40 members. You all well know that the tgf beta is uh, involved in the fibrosis of many organs. So when you have an injury, uh, and you have a formed scar. The scar anywhere in the body cannot form without the high expression of T TGF beta uh, isoforms and TGF beta genes. So let me start from uh, the definition. Let me start from the definition of uh, TRL. TRL means technology readiness level. And more and more often, uh, this is the term uh, regulatory agencies and also funding agencies are asking you uh, what is the stage of the development of your product. So I want to show you how from the academia we were capable of coming to the high level of the technology readiness level and being very close to the development of the first uh, drug for bone regeneration. It is a high challenge because there are only nine countries in the world capable of developing a drug from initial discovery to uh, the use and marketing approval. And if we discover, we will become country number 10 uh, capable of doing that. So, you know, you all know about European Research uh, Council. I gave you this uh, very simple slide uh, just to make a little bit fun. European Research Council is the only institution in Europe beyond the society's uh, budgets which is supporting uh, basic science. But this is basic science which comes uh, from an idea. This is technology readiness level zero, which means that I am a dreamer. Uh, many of these uh, dreaming ideas have not been confirmed, although published in Nature, Science and other perfect journals but have not been confirmed later by uh, different companies trying to reproduce the results and go over, and over into the further discoverment. So if you go to uh, TRA level one to four, then you are a laboratory red. That means you have done a lot of preclinical studies. If you come to TRA level six, four to six, that means you are in a transition and you are getting out of your comfort zone because you have to prove yourself many times that your data are reproducible and that you can go a next step because otherwise you run into the problems because nobody will fund your studies which you can own by yourself, not reproduce. So then when you come to uh, uh, technology readiness level six to nine, which means, for instance, AIDS accelerator funding, which is so open in Europe permanently all the time, then you come in the range when you are a real innovator. So that means uh, you go further with the development uh, of your product. Now, to transfer this into the steps uh, which you need to uh, develop a pharmaceutical product, you know, this is a line which takes normally 10 to 15 years in pharmaceutical industry. Can you imagine how long it should take then if you can reproduce all of this and you can collect enough money in academia? 
So you go through your phase of the research and then you go to uh, TRA level 6 and 7. 6 is uh, phase 1 clinical studies, uh, TRA 7 are phase 2 clinical studies, TRA 8 are phase 3 clinical studies, and TRA 9 is marketing and distribution and launch of your product. This is a long, long way and normally uh, nobody historically has done that within the academia because it is almost impossible. Therefore, large uh, uh, universities, when they have a significant discovery and they can patent the discovery, they uh, uh, license this patent out uh, to large pharmaceutical companies who will further develop your, your product. So, what, what should you do? What should you do to uh, progress your discovery, which is at the time at a low level of technology readiness level to a higher level. You know, the scientific education is much more complex uh, than before. You have to have uh, much more knowledge uh, on the further development of your discovery, and you have a good eye to find out uh, what is patentable in your research. You know, so the knowledge about patenting is today a requirement in universities and schools. You have to be much more aware of how to recognize something what is more uh, patentable, you know, and uh, therefore uh, development in academia, especially if you are not uh, additionally educated, comes beyond the TRL 4. So, you know, when you, for instance, uh, uh, apply for ERC grants, uh, and you want to go beyond the basic uh, research, you know, without the further de development, uh, you can still stay within the TRL 0 to 1. But if you want to go uh, further, you know, and that is more and more required by uh, European citizens, you know, the tax lawyers want to see some tax payers, want to see some benefits, you know, out of your research uh, for them. So. You know, if you are really uh, only uh, uh, individually curious, you know, that is uh, not funded anymore. And if you are an, uh, you know, individual who wants to build only your academic career and not give back enough to your uh, community, which is funding your research, it will be very difficult and such calls more or less in the Horizon program or any other European funded programs are not available anymore. So, uh, you know, I'm not speaking about now the great consortia like CERN, professional guidance, the astronomy, you know, funding programs and so on, when you have thousands of uh, co-authors and the uh, countries and uh, are, are funding mainly this research, you know, so this is not comparable with your individual efforts and the main, main basic uh, criteria for funding the, uh, the research. So, obviously, new research criteria and databases are urgently needed. What I want to show you, uh, for instance, do you believe that there is a, a correlation between a high-impact journal and the TRL level? I want to show you only a couple of examples from my own uh, experience. You know, this is one of the papers uh, where we have first uh, tried to, to use uh, the Matrigel. And Matrigel is a growth factor combination, you know, from the tumor of the red, where we have tested uh, different behavior of uh, bone cells on different uh, influence of extracellular matrix, including laminin, fibronectin, and so on, where we discovered first that BMPs or members from the TGO beta superfamily are binding to collagen type 4. That was a very important discovery because you <coughs> deliver the growth factors using the type 4 collagen. That was a long time ago, but it turned out, you know, that we characterized later uh, how many growth factors do you have Indeed, in this method of preparation, which is broadly used in many biological scientific areas, and we discovered that it is uh, rich in growth factors. That simply means you have to be very careful when you interpret the behavior of the cells 
in the major because it is very rich in the growth factors. And that was done, you know, when I was uh, in the United States together with Hinda Kleiman, who discovered laminin, with Anita Robles, who discovered TT Beta, Harry Reddy, who was one of the pioneers in DMP uh, and extracellular matrix fields. And, you know, we could not uh, uh, publish this paper in a high impact journal, so we went to experimental cell research. And this paper is continuously, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> cited from 1992 till today, and you know, it, it became uh, it became a, a TRL9. That means it became a product which is used in experimental research. And you see, they have been announcing that uh, till August 2022, and there was somewhere in April. You cannot buy it because of uh, difficulties in the deliveries and so on, as you well know. And its price today is still 612 euros. It's called major job basement membrane growth factor reduced. So sometimes you can come to, to the discovery that you even don't expect it. You know, we didn't have any benefits from it because it was just a publication. We did not uh, file a protection. Then, for, for instance, uh, look at this paper from Elizabeth Robertson. She is very famous in genetics. Uh, she published a paper on uh, BMP6 uh, mice uh, lacking the BMP6 genes, and she found only a delay in the ossification. However, many years later, you know, we, in collaboration with the Harvard University, we discovered that these animals they have a significant amount of iron accumulation in the liver, so they have some type of hemochromatosis. It was, uh, it was published uh, on the cover of uh, Nature, you know, and then many companies uh, went uh, after that to, to discover drugs and uh, to low down the iron uh, load in your organism, and today you have Many of these drugs are uh, under phase three clinical development, but also some earlier stages uh, to develop a BMP antibody therapy in clinical trials to prevent hemochromatosis uh, in people. Or, for instance, the paper we have published uh, recently in Nature Communications, it is still, you know, TRL three to four. To come to TRL9, it will take another 10 years and it will, it will take $30 million, you know, which is uh, impossible to, to do it at this time. But uh, it is also based, you know, on our discovery of many years ago. And it has been very shortly put into the 50 best papers in the translational and clinical research area, but we are not intended to, to develop this target uh, for uh, treating uh, fibrotic uh, diseases. However, all these discoveries, you know, we patented because patent is a critical issue if you want to protect your, your discovery. This discovery has also been patented. Uh, this is uh, a patent uh, in United States, which is uh, expiring in 2027 so if we have no clinical use of it, it it will go out and we are not developing this now why is that so because uh, we have developed something else and i want to show you how in academia we we developed uh, you know a drug which is uh, used to uh, uh, heal the bone and regenerate the bone the bone, when it bone breaks, you know, you, in, in between the bone ends, uh, there are, uh, it is uh, hematoma is formed. This hematoma is uh, lacking BMPs. There are no BMPs in the hematoma. And, you know, by doing some experimental work, we discovered by proteomics that one of these BMPs is circulating, and that is bone morphogenetic protein 6. After that, uh, we started to produce a large amount of BMP6 uh, in a biotechnological level. That, that was possible by bringing a friend of mine from the United States, from Genentech, who decided to go with us, uh, Dr. Herman Opperman, who is an expert for uh, expressing uh, BMPs in, uh, in uh, 
in big amounts, and he joined us and we were capable of doing that. And then, you know, the critical issue was to uh, prove that if you take a plasma and uh, put into animal BMP6 to circulate, you see, it will still circulate after a significant amount of time. But if you take a serum, then the serum, you know, will uh, eat up all the BMP. The BMP will uh, disappear. So it will remain in the plasma and in the serum, you see, it will disappear. Why was that so? Because it is accumulated uh, in uh, the blood clot. So we use the blood clot and that is autologous bone uh, blood clotting as a carrier for BMP6. So we use a standard system how the bone heals but instead of doing it from the bone, we took it from the uh, peripheral vein of the person. So, you know, finally, uh, we tested uh, many of these coaguli and then, uh, you know, got it uh, a very homologous, uh, cohesive, syringeable, injectable and malleable, and then went to the uh, UK regulatory agencies, which is MHRA, and they said, it is uh, excellent, we agree with you, this is very nice, but just show that it's very robust and reproducible. So we that reproduced in 1,200 human samples, doing that for several, several months uh, before we were sure that it would work. And we came to what we call now our osteogrow drug for bone regeneration, where you use a lyophilized BMP6, you put it into the blood, it goes into the blood clot, you remove the serum, take the blood clot, put it in between the bone ends, blood clot enriched with BMP6, and you get the bone regeneration in situations when the bone normally does not heal, when the normal physiological processes uh, do not work. So, luckily, you know, we got a European grant on 6 million euros at the beginning, and that was in 2011, two years before Croatia joined the European Union. That is the only such situation where Europe gives you to coordinate a grant uh, when you are not a member. And that was our great success because we get a help from many parties uh, within Europe. And, you know, I'm not going to show you now preclinical data. I can only show you this is uh, one of the animal experiments when you remove a critical amount of bone and then you put osteogrow in between the bone ends and we, you see that within a couple of weeks it heals uh, perfectly well, even, uh, you know, making uh, in continuity uh, the bone cortex. Uh, you know, it took us a lot of amount of time to, to develop a kit which you then use in clinical studies, which is a box B, which has ancillary items to prepare the implant, and the box A, in which you have lyophilized BMP and the water for injection where you uh, dissolve this BMP before you mix it with, uh, with the blood. And then the first clinical study or the first in human started in indication of distal radius fractures in patients in Zagreb in orthopedic and traumatological clinics in 2015. And the second study on high tibial osteotomy started in Vienna in 2016. The results turned out to be very good. Uh, they're all published, so you can easily find it in a, pub, in a PubMed. Uh, but I'll show you just a high tibial osteotomy, and that is when your, uh, uh, your foreleg is in a virus uh, position. So like uh, riding on a horse or soccer players, they always have these uh, rounded O legs. And then to prevent osteoarthritis, you, you, you see you make a, a wedge in between, and then you correct the curvature of the tibia and that is called high tibial osteotomy, and then you follow it for 24 months in between the bone ends of placebo and treat it, uh, treat it patients. This is the first uh, orthopedic study 
doing by the placebo because you use uh, autologous blood and you don't know whether you have BMP inside. So everybody is blinded. The surgeon is blinded. Uh, those uh, reading the outcomes are blinded, except of the pharmacist. Uh, now, you know, uh, in the conclusion of this first part, uh, it is a very safe in, in two clinical studies we have done at that time. Small amount is enough. It is very superior to other biological products. It is a carrier is very homologous, so you don't have even a, a, a compromised uh, response. It could be injected between the bone ends, and it will be much cheaper than other biological products. Um, you know, please come European, to uh, conclusion. Okay. The European uh, community uh, pronounced, uh, you know, uh, this uh, uh, project like one of the most uh, promising funded by the European Parliament, and it was shown in the uh, research uh, news uh, which go to the European Parliament me members. Today we have uh, a family of products. This is uh, Ostaugro if you combine BMP6 with autologous blood coagulum, and it is used in these clinical studies I show you. Then if you add allograft bone, like a compression resistant matrix, you have allograft A, and that is uh, increasing the biomechanical stability. And if you add a host bone, if you operate in the spine, it's called Ostogro B, and if you use synthetic ceramics, that's called Ostogro C. All these clinical studies are now ongoing. This one is going in China, it is finished. We transferred the technology to, to China. This is the first technology transferred ever to China with our uh, cell line, and they have done a good job, excellent job in 60 patients, and uh, the, the results are already available, but I cannot speak on them at this time because it's still, it's still uh, confidential uh, material. And you know, uh, what is uh, uh, next uh, in our program is to use uh, this stabilization in spine. And between two spine segments of the lumbar vertebrae, we can do uh, bone columns, uh, and inhibit the pain in between them. You know, Doris uh, lumbar back pain is one of the most uh, critical uh, conditions worldwide beyond uh, the flu. Flu is number one, and this is uh, number two. And we got another project immediately in continuation uh, from please, the European Please uh, move community. to the last slide. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Yeah. And, uh, at the time, you know, everything is uh, patenting, uh, and I want to show you just a team of uh, heavily volunteers and people from European community who are participating in this project. I believe we will have the first Oslo Grow project on the market in 2026. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting, thank you. So, um, next and final speaker is Dr. Um, Nir Ohad from the Mana Center Program for Food Safety and Security at Tel Aviv University, and he will speak to us about the role of academia in promoting sustainable food is it security. Working? Working? Over to you. So, thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me and for this wonderful meeting. Um, today, I would like to talk to you briefly about my research uh, to bring you to the entry point where I find myself engaged in food security and sustainability. Uh, just before the meeting, uh, I went for a short trip to Novi Sad, 80 kilometers north from here, and this is what I saw. This is a graffiti. I don't know who is the uh, artist. Uh, he has a signature there on the right uh, bottom part. But I think this is, uh, you know, sometimes one picture delivers a thousand words. Um, and what we haven't been concerned so much today is uh, about our, those regions on our planet that are most vulnerable. And I think we're misrepresented in those regions. And just for instance, here we can see, um, here we can see the man holding uh, this, this uh, globe uh, pointing to us, Africa, which is going to increase in population or double its in population within 20, 30 years to 2 billion people. 
um, and this is just an example. So um, you may not know, but uh, most of what we eat has been cultured over 10,000 years. And if you think what we're eating in the Far East or in South America or in Africa mm -hmm. or where I'm coming from, the Middle East, what's in common for all of these? We're eating plant embryos. Yes, we're eating plant embryos. The seeds that we're eating are the source for both of our proteins on the one hand, okay? These are coming from the embryos themselves and the carbohydrates from another sister tissue which is called endosperm. So I've been studying embryogenesis in plants for over 30 years. Uh, and this is how it brings me into this field of food security. Um, so last night we had a wonderful uh, concert. Thank you very much. It was really uh, a, an amazing uh, performance. And it will help me to explain to those who are not in the field of biology what is epigenetics. So the conductor here is telling each of the participants, though they have the same notes, the same blueprint, the same DNA in every cell, which one should perform its own part. And this is exactly what epigenetics is. It's a control of sets of commands beyond or above the level of the DNA telling each gene at every given cell what to do. In biology, it looks like this. This is the DNA wrapped in cores. We won't go into the exact mechanism, but we study mechanisms related to epigenetics, how the genome is conducted to perform its function. And I was working on modification of histones and DNA methylation, trying to identify target genes that govern plant embryogenesis. And indeed, we found some candidates. Um, and then I've moved to work on another plant, not flowering plants, but rather moss plants that evolved 450 million years ago. And these are the gametes of these plants. You can see the male egg cell and the, the female egg cell and the male gametes. And once fertilization takes place, yes, in those ancient plants still with us, this is a process that takes place. You find an embryo. Here's an embryo. So we can study in a simple model organism how embryogenesis in plants takes place. And using that, we're able eventually to find a particular gene that is expressed in plants, in moss plants, only in the egg cell, only in the female gamete. But then if you overexpress it in a plant, uh, what, you, what you obtain is a non-sexual embryo. That is, you can overcome the generation of an embryo within this simple plant, which will complete the life cycle. So what we see here is the adult embryo generating the next generation. And this, in this case, this is a spore. So they distribute spores. Why I'm telling you this? Because this is an entry point to understand plant embryogenesis in general. And the next phase we're trying is to identify the genes that make such an embryo and then try to translate it into flowering plants and then translate it into commercial plants. So this was my entry point, but we're facing a much bigger problem. So between me and the coffee break, there's only 15 minutes left. But if you consider the real problem, imagine you won't be able to go to your coffee break. This is a real danger, right? But actually coffee is threatened. Uh, mustard this year was a major problem for France due to the extensive heat wave we have all experienced, Europe and worldwide. So there's a real threat on our food security. It's not just the increase in population, which we need to face. It's the ability to generate the food for this amount of people. Okay, and on top of that, now we're facing also climate change uh, with many effects on our environment. And one of the biggest effects is drought effects heat waves, floods, we've encountered or saw most of them during these talks, which we need to take into account. Now, these effects are affecting us in a rapid, progressive way. So for some of those, we don't have enough time. We need to think what we're going to do next fast. Um, so climate change, as we said, has a major impact on our food production. It has a major impact on our surrounding and on our markets, on our job place, on our well-being at all. Israel is included, so I'll talk today about my experience and my work 
related to Israel. And we have about 20% of food insecurity among our population related mostly to income. So this is the present uh, snapshot of where we are today, but what's in to us for the future. So the MANA Center program, which I'm heading in Tel Aviv University for the last eight years, is taking three approaches, three pillars of activity, research, education, and outreach, in order to promote food security in Israel and as possible worldwide. And how do we do that? We're trying to engage between uh, international partners, our own research in Tel Aviv University, and other partners locally in Israel, like the uh, agriculture research station, the governmental research station uh, in Israel. And we combine that with education, research, and public outreach, and we bring those together. This is what we try to accomplish. Um, so we're in a complex global crisis. We have climate change, which affects our weather. We have, as we've heard in a previous session, uh, water issues, food issues, energy, which impose upon biodiversity, diseases, employment, income, a whole list of things that are affecting us immediately. And what, what should we do? So if you look at the timeline, we have a short, mid, and long-term uh, interventions that we need to take. I think the most important one which affects us at the short time is to implement policy. Um, so we need to push down on the brake and we need to affect our policy makers uh, and then to use the tools we have, including the research, in including new strategies. So we're talking about big science, but before we reach big science, there are still measures that we can do. And I'll try to give you some examples from what we're doing. So let's start with research. And we're trying to use a whole range of methodologies. So here's one example. Tilapia fish is one of the third largest uh, source of proteins. In Israel, it's a small portion. But still, we're growing tilapia. Five years ago, growers came to our researchers and told us there is a new disease. They didn't knew, they knew, they didn't knew what was the reason. Uh, researchers from our institute, supported by the MANA Center, uh, have tried to find the cause and found it's a new virus that was never discovered before the virus was sequenced. Based on the sequence, now after five years, they're developing a vaccine for tilapia. The same similar process that we've been using for COVID. Now, this disease is present worldwide. It's probably have been distributed from hatcheries in the Far East and then uh, been turning around all over the world. So here's another example. Rust in, in, uh, in wheat. It's coming from probably center of Africa. It's being faster moving since climate change in the last few years. And there is no immunity against it. This fungus can destroy whole um, crops in, in one season. Um, so one way to go about it is to try defense genes uh, from native wheat, um, which is the emmer wheat. The source of it is in the Mediterranean, and researchers uh, from our institute have been um, sequencing the wild emmer wheat genome, based on which they can identify now resistant genes that then can be transferred by a long process into the commercial wheat. So this is another major breakthrough. So these are just examples. This is a very long project. The previous one could have been completed in only five years. I'm saying only because in science, this is relatively a very short term event. Um, using remote sensing uh, for different aspects. Here's a project which is led by uh, Professor Eyal Bendor together with uh, researchers in Tapor University. So here we're experiencing interaction with other university looking at the uh, soil and salination of soil in Punjab, you may know. There is a serious problem of uh, withdrawing too much underground water, which salinate the water uh, table. And uh, you need to look into the water quality and you need to look at the soil quality. And this is something they're doing uh, together. Now, in that particular point, there is a real importance of policy which is not being taken place. And Punjab is the basin of food for India and exporting all over the world. Here's another ex example. This is uh, looking into sensors that could detect the well-being of plants. This is a collaboration between a professor of uh, 
microelectronics and a plant researcher putting on a plant a sensor that upon triggering a particular gene will report through electric current to a cloud the presence of a particular problem on the plant. And this is something that has initiated only a few years ago, again, by the support of the center, and has already been implemented or uh, initiated in a startup company. And almost the uh, last two examples, uh, Professor Yossi Shacham is, uh, Yossi Yovel is studying bats, uh, sonar, but he's also implementing uh, what he's studying for agriculture, remote automated uh, devices, pruning, spraying, harvesting, detecting, and picking up fruits. This is the new advancement in agriculture that could allow us to go into precision agriculture and implementation. And maybe the last example, so we all know that agriculture has a footprint and we're trying to minimize that footprint uh, in light of the uh, global aspects of water issues that we've just heard in the previous uh, session. And uh, so, you know, for one hamburger, one hamburger, we're using 2,500 liters. It's not that that particular one hamburger consumed that water, but what we need to feed the animals in order to get that one piece of uh, meat uh, takes a lot of water. So, you know, there are different ways to go about it. Of course, the new era brings us new technologies, for instance, and Israel is not the only one who's implying it, but cultured meat could be the next step to provide uh, resources of protein uh, away from the animal itself, but this is not the only source that you can use. Uh, we can, of course, use others. So we've talked a lot about different issues, including water scarcity, water problem. So here's a lesson from a small country. We've talked about big projects in big countries. Here's a lesson that we can learn from a small country. And as you may know, Israel produces about 80% of its water by desalination of seawater. 80%. Uh, and then most of this water, domestic water, is then reflowing back into waste treated, treated uh, plants. 90% of all wastewater are then treated and then used only for agriculture, not for drinking. And then we're using new technologies, which is the drip irrigation system, which allow us to use irrigation in remote desert regions. And this technology has been now uh, been harvested or been harnessed and used all over the world. Uh, it's a simple technology, but sometimes simple is very efficient. So here you have a whole cycle, and Israel is a demonstration site to implement all these technologies for other places in the world. So if we are thinking what can be done, we don't need to invent a wheel. We need to use the technologies that are available already now. Um, California crisis in water could have enjoyed such technologies long before if they would have used, for instance, desalination plants ahead of time and wastewater treatments uh, along with it. The next pillar is the outreach. So we've talked about how the academy could interact with public. So here's an example. Uh, we're doing this on Science Day on our campus, myself in front of students. We're doing it along the country on Earth Day, uh, where we talked about um, um, existence. And so 100 researchers went all over the country to meet the people and tell them about the environment, about the local problems and uh, solutions. And we can in front, uh, confront or talk to 1,000 people at once at uh, dedicated sessions to explain to the public in person what are the different crises, what are the different solutions, and how can the individual engage in solving it. And each one of us can do something if we just think of how we consume things, what are the materials we're using, and so forth. And then we can engage with the uh, policymakers and the different companies and NGOs. This is what we've done in 2016. We had a big international conference on sustainable food systems, having a, our major, major guest uh, uh, speaker, Professor Mayan Nessel from uh, NYU and our Minister of Health. Um, and the one thing that we generated from this meeting was a call for action. I won't go through all, through all of it, but to formulate a national master plan to make a task force for inducing a, a, 
uh, sustainable food systems, um, and to make sure that we have a food basket that is meeting the dietary needs of the people who are going to consume them. And this is very important. As you've seen, every nation or every culture use a particular type of food. You cannot force people to eat what they're not accustomed to. It's very difficult. Just 20 years ago, when Japan was in a crisis of generating their own rice, they were trying to buy from California their own type of rice, and the Japanese did not accept it because it doesn't match their own type of uh, rice they're eating. And yes, and based on that, uh, we've published uh, uh, two years later uh, a book chapter related to the challenges of food security. So we can engage with the politician, and indeed, actions were taken, and the Ministry of Health has imposed particular or used particular recommendations from these meetings. Um, and then we've went through COVID, and again, uh, scientists, including me has engaged with the government to implement immediate short-term and long-term uh, policies to match the need of food security during the COVID crisis. So we scientists can engage with the governments and with the policymakers to try and help. <clears throat> um, at the university, we're making or we're establishing a sustainable council to look into what can be done to reduce our uh, CO2 footprint and there are different policies that can be taken, increased sonal panels, even asked our professors to shift their investment of their pension and to some extent into renewable energies. So uh, we're also engaged in teaching. This is some of my students and some of them have moved into companies related to uh, new technologies of food production like alternative meat and so on. But we also have uh, programs which I invite students to come, a summer program on food security. Here is an excursion we did to those water plants I've just described to you, as well as an international uh, master programs where graduates are now doing the ripple effect and training uh, other students. For instance, here in Liberia, one of our graduates opened his own training center. So we're training the trainers. So this is a holistic approach using research, education, and outreach to try and do what one can do. So this is me with the frame of what can be done within one center. And our first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, said, where there is a will, there is a way. So we, as academics, need to push our policymakers to have the will. We have the tools. I hope I've given you enough food for thought, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> now, the previous session ran a bit late, so I think we do have a bit of time for questions. Um, I would like to begin um, using the privilege of the chair but with a comment, and that is to remind everybody that uh, if we be serious about uh, uh, sustainability, we have to think in terms of systems change. We cannot look at anything in isolation. Two examples relevant to the first and the last paper. The first about the fermentation of essential oil, the production of essential oils from fermentation. Wonderful idea. However, I was struck by the comparative table you had, which said that this production does not require any herbicides or insecticides or anything like that, of course. Very little water, relatively little water. but. You also have to count the cost of producing the, the uh, cornstarch. Yeah. If you factor that in and you look at the inputs, <coughs> then maybe it will look differently. Yeah. So I, and uh, bef I before you start, and for the, the, uh, the, the third paper, the uh, uh, this depiction of the water management system is in Israel, which is famous and highly regarded, but I was struck also by the fact that at one end there was the uh, water desalination and of course the question is raised how is that water desalinated if it's not with renewable energy you may be doing very well on water but not very well on carbon emissions so we always have to we'll think. touch upon that if, if we'll okay if you would yeah. like to comment both but please, please. Yeah, so I've, thank you. so I've made the calculation on uh, how much Pesticides are used to make an essential oil through a plant method and to make it through a, a fermentation. Eh? So the acreage 
of a, of a growing uh, an essential oil crop uh, compared to an acreage for growing the sugar to make a, an essential oil crop. It's like a factor 100 between it or more, depending on the essential mm. oil crop. And the amount of pesticides used on, uh, in particular, uh, corn and sugar beet, for example, is, is quite low compared to what is used in essential oil crops because there's much more genetic diversity being used there. Uh, so basically, the, so you make uh, several orders of magnitude improvement there. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we are not completely uh, out of uh, pesticides because yeah, you need a way to grow your carbon. Okay, so you factored it in, in yeah. other words. Now let's yeah. go. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so thank you for the question. Indeed, at present, there is still a lot of use of non-renewable non energy to produce electricity in general in Israel, mm. including for the desalination plants. Yeah. But there is a shift towards renewable energy. And on top of that, there is an initiative to do a regional project between Jordan and Israel to try and generate huge solar uh, systems in Jordan, provide the energy to Israel, Mm -hmm. and in, in replacement to give them water from the re, uh, desalination plants. So yeah. this is something that, you know, in the future could help regionally both to increase peace and to save our planet. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. And I open to the floor. Um, there were a number of questions. Yes. I want to thank all of the speakers, very interesting presentations. Uh, your work uh, for bone re regeneration, uh, two items. Uh, number one, have you thought of um, uh, for osteoporosis treatment? I know your, tr your method is very local, but uh, what uh, can be done also for more global kind of part of the uh, skeletal system? And also, um, you uh, talked about, and we know the long range of development of a treatment uh, for 12 years and so on. Uh, what have we learned from the development of the COVID vaccine and the mRNA methods also, but also the process that was uh, uh, made to certify that shortened the period to, in a sense, use it for other kind of uh, for pharmaceuticals, which is, and by the way, you mentioned TRLs. I've, in the Department of Defense, tr 9 is combat ready. <laughs> it's not only innovation, <laughs> but maybe the pharmaceutical industry has more strength and standards. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for your comment and questions uh, regarding uh, the osteoporosis. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you have the osteoporotic uh, fractures, but uh, when you make epidemiological studies and follow what people have done, uh, there is no, for instance, uh, more appearance of non-unions in people with osteoporosis, which is uh, a wrong belief, you know, that people with osteoporosis would have uh, more non-healing fractures. Uh, that's not correct. So, uh, this therapy can be used equally, you know, with people with osteoporotic fractures and with uh, people who are of younger age. For instance, if you follow uh, long bone fractures, which is uh, tibia, femur, and humerus, you have a peak between 35 and 45 uh, years of age. While in osteoporosis, you know, you have uh, fractures of the lumbar spine by compression. Uh, in these patients, there is uh, currently no solution. Although Steve Cummings, who is a good friend of mine, and he is one of the most famous people in the field, uh, he is from San Francisco. First, he asked me, can you help uh, women with collapsed uh, uh, with collapsed uh, vertebral bodies. And I told him, look, uh, if we can do that, that will be uh, a miracle, you know, like a miracle of uh, insulin in 2021, you know, <laughs> when it is just a miracle. And from my point of view, uh, miracles uh, exist only in medicine. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, if we were capable of doing that, but you know, there is a possibility of doing that because now for these patients you use uh, a balloon intervention. When you have a collapse, uh, then you put a balloon inside and this is more a palliative te therapy. If you now can make an extender between two vertebral bodies and then introduce a blood clot inside and wait at least for three months, you know, to get enough bone in between, it's a big question. Can we regenerate uh, vertebrae by trabecular structures uh, in the patient? So that's futuristically the most uh, important uh, aspect. As a second one is the uh, bone and the prosthesis replacement, you know, especially in the hip, you know, when you don't have any bone, nothing left, you know, how are you now going to replace anything over there without making new bone? You know, it's not impossible. So that is what we are doing now, but it's extremely difficult, you know, horribly di difficult. And, uh, uh, you know, pharmaceutically, what you ask, you know, it is uh, to do something in uh, academic environment is just a suicide because uh, uh, you miss funds all the time. And we were extremely lucky to get one after the another, you know, European funding of six uh, million euros. But in the development of the drug, it's nothing, you know, because normally you, you take, uh, you need between 800 millions, millions and 3.5 billion uh, uh, dollars, you know. So far, we have invested 35 million and make a value of the company, which I started 100 million, you know. But now we have a lot of interest from big pharmaceutical companies, but I don't want to dilute now when we were at uh, technology level seven done. And we have applied now for European Union for AIDS accelerator, which gives you up to 15 million euros, and we have passed step one. So there is a chance. But in the meantime, we have transferred the technology to China. And that is the first uh, transfer to China ever from US and from Europe. Nobody wants to deal with China. But the only reason why we wanted to deal with China is because these are my friends from Pfizer and Amgen back to China, you know. So they have this uh, 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 Western honesty, you know, in, in writing agreements and everything. So I have no fear that we will be cheated, you know. And now uh, they finished the study with 60 people, you know, in. Uh, in spine and they have outstanding results you know a spine is number one uh, commercially so a spine you have five million of people you know where you normally in europe and us uh, use that yeah okay thank you maybe we have time for one more question very interesting insights into the the politics of funding there thank you thank you yes for professor Beekweiler. I want to thank you very much for that wonderful presentation <clears throat> on the biotechnology of the production of terpenes. Terpenes, of course, are essential for cellular uh, membranes and functions, and they are synthesized by essentially all life forms on Earth. At about the same time that uh, 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 Leopold Rzika was formulating the uh, the fundamental law that he set forth, uh, Oro and Nuno were detecting pristane and phytane in the Orge carbonaceous meteorite. And now it is known that all of these meteorites, all of the carbonaceous chondrites, contain a wide variety of terpenoids. One of the questions is, could you please tell what is the current state of the art on the abiotic synthesis of terpenes? Abiotic. Abiotic synthesis of terpenes. What is the current state of the art there? Um, so, um, the, so I'm not sure if I understand your 
question correct, but uh, of course chemical synthesis is quite uh, well progressed huh, of uh, terpenes. Uh, they know how to do this from uh, simple starting materials. Uh, the, what they fail to do is to get really specific stereochemistry in the, in the molecules, which is essential for the, for the bioactivity, basically, so for the organoleptics and for the, um, you know, the bio, uh, the, if you have a pharmaceutical ingredient, it needs to, be stere it needs to have a certain stereoconformation. Um, so, uh, basically, so they reach their limits in what they can do in, in, in uh, generating very specific molecules with a very specific conformation and the more complex the molecules get, the more difficulty they have, the more yield penalties they have, so the prices go sky high. And that's why people try to, you know, uh, create more microbial systems to produce them, but also plant-based systems or plant cell culture-based systems. Uh, for example, uh, people have tried to make uh, taxus uh, cell cultures, and I think there's also a company doing that to produce taxol, which is an extremely complex molecule, very difficult to synthesize, but these plant cell cultures can do that. But on the other hand, on the other hand so cultivating plant cells is a very challenging thing, and they, they face very frequently like collapses in their culture or genetic drift in their culture. So it's quite uh, challenging and so it would be better or more um, robust if they could make a microbial <laughs> system from that, but the pathway is so complex that this takes a few years to establish. Okay, thank you. I think we have been notified that we should end the session. I think we, uh, we uh, have not added further uh, delay, but uh, we haven't also made any time good. But thank okay. you, Chairman. <laughs> thank you, everyone.